We praise you, God, as the one true God, the creator supreme, God almighty, and there is none like you. There was none and nothing before you and nothing that will exist above and beyond you. You are eternal, you are holy, you are just, you are righteous. We thank you, Father, for your holy word, the Bible. You've preserved it for us, that we may read it and learn of your great and perfect love for us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who lived perfectly in obedience to you, who willingly gave himself for each person that they may not be condemned to what we deserve, but be brought to life and wholeness in you. Holy Spirit, I ask for your presence here tonight, your enablement, your empowerment as I deliver this lecture. Be with me. Allow me to deliver this lecture with clarity and on time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, men. My aim tonight is the gift of salvation cost Jesus his life. The gift of salvation cost Jesus his life. It's only 14 verses uh, this week, and uh, I'm, I'm astonished because last year uh, in, in the study, I think I had like 45 books of Isaiah in one lecture, so I guess if you average out the two, I'm, uh, I'm on par for a normal lecture, but it's a very short one. Uh, so let's open up your Bibles, men. It is April Fool's Day, but I just couldn't think of anything appropriate to share. So uh, if it wasn't on the crucifixion of Christ, I'm going to ask one of the ladies to come and give the lecture for five or six minutes and see how long it took for you men to revolt. But uh, I couldn't think of anything appropriate for this lecture, so we'll move on. But open up your Bibles, men. Uh, John chapter 19, verses 17 to 30. Uh, there's so much that this covers, and I have three divisions tonight. So division one is John 19, verses 17 to 24. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus suffers crucifixion. <laughs> Jesus suffers crucifixion. And all of the gospel accounts, when we look at them, rightfully record the crucifixion. Uh, not that we'll cover the other accounts today, but there are three other accounts. So in Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 to 56, we have one account. In Mark 15, verses 21 to 41, we have another account. And then in Luke 23, we have verses 26 to 49, which is a third account. Uh, and respectively, we have 25 verses, 21 verses, and 24 verses. And John is noticeably very brief in his, um, in his uh, uh, re uh, recording of the crucifixion account. Just 14 verses total. And I don't know the reason why, but I thought it was important for us to note that. Uh, you know, we could make a lot of suppositions. Was this something that was extremely difficult for John to recount and record, right? Uh, because based on uh, John's closeness to the events, uh, we believe even John is referenced here in, in, in a part, was it very difficult for John to recount? Or does the brevity of it uh, provide some sort of um, sacred uh, underscoring uh, for the event? I don't know the exact reason, but it's something for us to ponder. And uh, as I was thinking about it, I, I love how it, uh, this lecture uh, and this lesson really coincided with our liturgical calendar this year. And um, uh, believe me, men, one thing that I think is important is that we recount this as a historical event. So as we look at Good Friday just a few days ago, uh, as we relive that event, uh, that would have been about 1, 000, uh, 1991. So 1,991 years, give or take a few years. Uh, but it, it would have been close to 2,000 years ago. Read with me John chapter 19, verse 17. And I'm reading from the NIV. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. In the previous lesson, we studied how Jesus endured a brutal flogging uh, before being handed over to be crucified. Uh, and this flogging, in many cases, would be fatal to many, 
and many would have died from the pain, the shock, and the destruction that such a flesh-ripping lashing would bear. Now, as we look at the crucifixion, John does not record any of the gory or grisly details. And although the details aren't recorded here, I, I felt it would be important for anyone who hasn't considered these points to talk about the crucifixion just for a minute here. So crucifixion was a very painful and a cruel and public form of execution. Uh, the criminal would be affixed to the poles by ropes or nails through the wrists and a, and a single nail through the ankle bone with the legs tucked up in a fetal position. And the dying process in, in some cases could take up to three days as the person being punished uh, endured this uh, basically asphyxiation and exhaustion that would occur. The criminal would have to push up their body on the nails to get air into their lungs. And they would continue to do this until they finally reached exhaustion, eventually dying of suffocation. It was, an uh, it was an excruciatingly painful death. And crucifixion was so horrible a form of execution that the Romans who decreed this would not even dispense this type of punishment on their own citizens. That's how heinous it was. So Jesus, carrying his own cross, comes to the place Golgotha. And if you have your lesson books with you, you could turn to the first few pages. And around page 7 from the front, you'll have a map that's titled the City of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. And you have the City of Jerusalem, and in the northeastern, well, I'm sorry, northwestern part, I'm, I'm getting my directions mixed up here. But outside the city wall, uh, uh, there's marked there a place that is thought to be Golgotha. It was right outside, when you look at the map, you'll see that it was right outside the city wall and just about a quarter of a mile from Herod's uh, palace and the praetorium where, the, where Pilate and the Roman guards were likely staying. So just about a quarter of a mile. The Latin equivalent of the word Golgotha is Calvaria, which is from where in English we get the word Calvary. And it was likely a low, barren hill along a major roadway. Romans typically would crucify in public places so that people could see the criminal suffer and it would serve as a deterrent to criminal activity. Read with me John chapter uh, verse 18, uh, 19 verse 18. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Very important point here. Jesus is crucified with two other criminals. And what can we take from that? We have a full identification with sin. Christ takes on what he hasn't earned or what he doesn't deserve. But Christ is being counted with the wicked, those deserving of death, right, those rightfully deserving with death. Read on with me, verses 19 to 22. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Just a reminder that this was during uh, the time of Passover. And in Jerusalem was likely, at this point, filled with people uh, who came eager to celebrate this most important and essential festival of Passover. In these few verses, uh, we have that the charges were written in three languages. So we have Aramaic, which was the daily language of the Jews in uh, Ju Judea uh, during that time of Jesus. Uh, we have Latin, which is the language of uh, Rome. So it, it was all the civil law and all, all the, it, 
it was the official language of the government, right? So you have Latin, and then you also have Greek, which is the common trade language of the Eastern Roman uh, Empire. We even have an internal reference in John. If you go back uh, just a few chapters earlier to John chapter 12, verse 20, uh, right at the start of this chain of events in this last time that Jesus would um, be in Jerusalem for Passover, we have actually even a set of Greeks who came seeking Jesus during this time, just six days earlier. So that, that was in John 12, verse 20. So there's a lot packed into the fact that those three languages were um, represented when uh, the charges for Jesus was presented above the cross. You could see that as the three languages representing the universal scope of the gospel. Anyone who walked past during that time, uh, chances are not only that they understood one, but that they understood multi uh, mul uh, two or even all three of those languages that the charges were written in. And I wonder, men, did the hearts of the passerby who were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, to those who came to actually look forward to the Messiah, did their hearts burn within them at that time? Read with me verses 23 to 24. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, uh, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. We have in this passage, in these short verses, a fulfillment of what was written a thousand years, about a thousand years prior to the event in Psalms 22. Uh, if we read Psalm 22, verses 17 to 18, it reads, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. We have here, in this moment, Jesus is laid bare on the cross. He's stripped naked, bearing the shame of sin. Now, in a physical sense, we have Jesus being laid bare, but you also need to look at this in terms of a spiritual sense. Jesus is also being laid bare, naked, fully exposed, as he's expelled from the presence of God, his Father. As Jesus takes on the sin that he did not need to bear, on the sin that was not deserving of him, as Jesus takes on my sin, as Jesus takes on your sin, as Jesus takes on the sin uh, of the entire world, God, his Father, who previously said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, God, his Father, cannot in his holiness commune with his son. Christ is not fit to be in the presence of the Father. With Christ's nakedness, man receives the opportunity to be covered in Christ's righteous clothing. And that brings me to my first principle, which is the severity of Jesus' suffering and sacrifice reveals the seriousness of humanity's sin. The severity of Jesus' suffering and sacrifice reveals the seriousness of humanity's sin. Jesus Christ, if you think about it, and we studied this earlier, Jesus Christ was already glorified in God. We read that in John chapter 1, that Jesus was there present during creation, one with the Father, one with the Spirit. But God loved us so much that he sent his Son to die for us. We cannot overlook the depth or depravity of sin. And we may at times try to dismiss it 
as saying it's not that bad, it's not that serious an issue, it's not that bad a problem. And it's very easy for mankind in our fallen nature to minimize the severity of the problem that ex exists. But the fact is that Christ, the Son of God, had to leave the heavenly realms where he, where he existed in perfect communion with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. This starts to give us an idea of the magnitude and the size of the solution that's required for man's sin, for my sin. Beyond, beyond just lowering himself to come to earth in human form, Jesus had to do even more. He had to die. He had to die to save mankind, to provide a path, to provide a way, to provide a bridge to the Father. Believe me, men, if there was another solution, Christ's death would have been in vain and it would not have been required. The severity of Jesus' suffering and sacrifice reveals the seriousness of humanity's sin. A few application questions from this, men. Let me ask, what burden do you carry that you need to turn over to the Lord? And what's stopping you from letting Jesus carry the burden of that sin? And how does the actions that Jesus took for you about 2,000 years ago, the sacrifice that he made impact you now? And how is it transforming your living today? Division 2, uh, John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Uh, Jesus lovingly cared for his mother. So read with me verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of uh, Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. All right, as I was, I was, as I was reading uh, these verses, the first thing that drew, draw, drew my attention is that we see here Jesus referring to Mary as woman. And uh, a lot of times people would say, oh, Tom, it's just coincidence. But my first lecture this year was actually lesson three. And in lesson three, we covered John chapter two, the wedding at Cana, and we have that same event recorded and that same response recorded. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, guys. But that really stuck out at me. We have Jesus referring to Mary in the same way he did back in John chapter two. Woman, uh, so John chapter two, verse four reads, woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. How amazing is that? We covered back in lesson three, although, you know, in the translation here, it may seem as a rude way uh, for Jesus to address his mother. We covered in verse, uh, in, uh, during lesson three, that it was actually a polite term. Uh, if you go back to your notes, pages uh, 45 and 46 from the notes from Lesson 3 provides more details on that. But I got to wondering, as you know, that really struck a chord with me, I wonder how Mary took it that day. Was that miracle brought back into Mary's remembrance that day? And that was at the start of Jesus' earthly ministry and mission to us. And here we see at the conclusion, a similar term being used. We also note that even in suffering, Jesus lovingly cares for his earthly mother, even as Christ is pouring himself out so that his mother Mary can be cleansed of sin, fixing the deepest need that she has, Jesus compassionately still provides for Mary's uh, immediate need as well by entrusting who we believe is John, the disciple um, whom he loved uh, with the care of his mother. And we also see that it goes both ways. 
Did Jesus also sense the pain that the disciple he loved might have been feeling? And he entrusted his mother to the care of, of this disciple. It's very uh, important to note that men, as believers, Christ gives us the relationships in our lives that we need. A lot of times, they may not be the relationships we want, but Christ gives us the relationships we need. And that brings me to my second principle, which is Jesus' suffering reveals his compassion for sinners. Jesus' suffering reveals his compassion for sinners. A few application questions from this. How has Christ's sacrifice enabled or empowered you to extend compassion, love, and care to others who may be suffering? And where may you need God's help to see beyond your own suffering to comfort others? And who has Jesus, who has Jesus entrusted to your care for you to form a relationship with in a deep and meaningful way? Who has Jesus entrusted you with? All right, men. Let's look at the time here. All right, John chapter, all right, division three. <clears throat> division three, John chapter 19, verses 23 to 30. Just two more verses to go. Jesus declared his work finished and gave up his spirit. Jesus declared his work finished and gave up his spirit. Read with me uh, verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And I literally am thirsty too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am thirsty. There's so much in that one statement. And let's take a few minutes and unpack, unpack that. In verse 28, we see uh, Jesus fulfilling prophecy. There's prophecy from the Psalms that's covered there, uh, Psalm 22. We also have Psalm 69, verse 21. Think about this. And again, just a coincidence, I'm sure, that I had lesson five. So Jesus, who was the life-giving water, becoming thirsty here. In John chapter 4, when we studied lesson 5, we read about Jesus and the woman at the well and how Jesus proclaimed himself to be the life-giving water. Those who come to him would never be thirsty again. So what's the significance of this here in verse 20, 28? This, I am thirsty. Here we have another indication of Jesus taking on sin, a full identification with mankind's sin, with mankind's brokenness, with, mankind, uh, with mankind's need. Christ became thirsty. He's parched. By doing so, Jesus fulfills the plan that God his Father had put into motion. In John 19, verses 29 to 30, we read, A jar of, of, of wine vinegar was there, so they, spoke, uh, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, of, of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Seems like a small detail here, but we have the mention of a hyssop plant and with that, we have a connection to Passover and, and also the Passover meal. As the Jewish leaders sat down and priests planned to sit down that night for dinner, did their hearts ache for the yearning and fulfillment of what the Passover commemorated and what it looked forward to? Let's take a minute, men, and look back at the Exodus account. So Exodus chapter 12 verses 21 to 28. And I'll read it uh, quickly here. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once and select the animals for your family and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop 
dip it in the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Verse 24, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord has promised you, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So we have here, as the hyssop is bringing forth the sour wine to Jesus, we see that the hyssop is actually, uh, in, um, in a way, picking up right the blood of the perfect Passover lamb. Verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is complete. We'll get back to that in a moment. I'd like to talk about the doctrine for this week. And the doctrine for this week is justification. And in justification, we see that Christ death on the cross sufficiently paid for the sins of the entire world. However, Christ's righteousness is only imputed, it's only given, it's only credited to people who receive that sacrifice by faith, the salvation that Jesus offers. God justifies believers who trust in, who accept Christ for salvation, crediting Christ's perfect righteousness to them. Now, justification is a legal term referring to God's gracious act of forgiving and declaring a sinner righteous based on Christ's sacrifice. So this is not a forgiveness where the Lord just says you are forgiven. There is something that's required in return, and that's the blood of Christ. God sent his son to bear the just penalty that sin required. Now, because of Jesus, God does not compromise his righteous standards when he justifies a sinner based on Jesus' substitutionary death. God doesn't overlook sin. Jesus' death perfectly satisfies God's absolute righteousness and God's justice. Jesus, as we studied all throughout this, uh, the Gospel of John, Jesus perfectly kept God's law. And no human can do that. And God credits that perfection, that life of Christ, onto the believer in place of our own record of sin. Believers who accept Christ as Savior, they're justified in in God's sight. Now justification, it's a one-time, unchangeable declaration of the believer's righteousness in Christ. It happens one time and it's unchangeable. The ruling's final. Once justified in Christ, always justified in Christ. Beyond that, we have sanctification. And sanctification, by contrast, it refers to that ongoing process in the life of a believer, where a believer grows in practical righteousness in daily life. But that justification comes first, before that sanctification. Now, when I don't believe that God justifies sinners because of Christ's sacrifice, I carry the weight of my own sin without any remedy or recourse, and I likely try to earn God's favor, which I can't do. There's nothing I can offer God which will provide the justification that I desperately need. Now, when I believe that I've been justified by God's grace and through Christ's sacrifice, and I can accept that freely, I face life 
and eternity with confidence. My standing before God, it doesn't depend on my own behavior, but it rests on Christ's perfect righteousness. Because I've been justified through Christ, I'll never face the condemnation that I'm so deserving because of my sin. Christ had to lay down his life. Don't be mistaken, men. No one could have taken it from Christ. As we were studying in the last lecture, uh, lesson, it's very easy for us in the sham of a trial to see Jesus as the victim, right? The victim to the Jewish leaders. But that's not the case. John chapter 10, verse 18. John 10, 18. This is Jesus speaking. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. So this is Jesus talking about his life. Make no mistake, men. Until Jesus experienced and suffered this horrible and painful death, Christ's payment for sin was not made. It wasn't made until verse 30. When Jesus received his drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Until Jesus Christ was emptied of life, until Christ's perfect life transposed over my sin, over your sin, over mankind's sin, until Christ's perfect life took that, uh, took that and bared my sin, Christ's work was not finished. Until the blood flowed out from Christ's physical body, until Christ's spirit ceased to exist within that spiritual form, until Christ was emptied out and sacrificed, his mission was not complete. The gospel would not be complete. It would be incomplete. In fact, the gospel would not exist. There would be no good news. All the physical healing that Jesus had done during his time on earth, uh, during his ministry, they would have been nothing more than a temporary physical fix for that time. Peter would have died hopeless and unredeemed in his denial of Christ. The Holy Spirit would not be here uh, the bones of the forefathers, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they'd still be awaiting the fulfillment of God's promise of redemption. The curse that was upon Adam and Eve's offspring would stand, and we would all be condemned to death. Death would rule over mankind. The words of the prophet would still be pending. But thanks be to God, that's not the case. In Christ's death, we have victory over sin. Covered by Christ's blood, covered by Christ's sacrifice, we are redeemed and we're given a new worth. We cross over from death to life. We studied that earlier this year, didn't we, men? John chapter 5. You can look at John chapter 5, verse 24, or verses 18 to 27. In Christ's death, we receive the remedy and the cure for the events in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, we read about man's in, um, insufficient attempts to cover their own nakedness by sewing fig leaves together. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, right? And from that forward, God promises redemption. And what do we see at the close of that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21? We see uh, and we read, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. And that was pointing forward to this event, where, where God will provide the perfect lamb that we may be clothed in Christ's righteousness. Uh, for those taking notes, uh, another verse, uh, uh, another reference to look at, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21. So 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 21. I'll just read uh, the last two verses there to, to be short on time here. So verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making uh, his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus provides victory, men. And that brings me to my final, final principle, principle three. 
Jesus died sacrificially so believers can live eternally. Jesus died sacrificially so believers can live eternally. And we live eternally free. We live eternally cleansed by his precious blood. Nothing else cleanses. Nothing else, men, can set us free except for this, the precious blood of Christ that flowed out from his body as God placed on him the punishment that I deserved, that you deserved, that mankind deserved. The punishment for not meeting God's holy and righteous standards. When God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees Christ's righteousness transposed over top of my sin. So men, a few application questions. How does the truth of Christ's finished work bring you hope today? And how does this truth change? Listen closely to me, men. How does this truth change how you value yourself? You are precious. You are so precious to the Lord. And how will you share the beauty, the reality, and the power found in Christ with those in your life? As we close this lecture, men, uh, the gift of salvation cost Jesus his life. I want to close with uh, a, a short passage here from Colossians 2, verse 18 to, tw uh, I'm sorry, Colossians 2, verse 8 to 15. And I'll just read the last three verses there, verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus completed the work that he came to do, and Christ glorified his Father in this, men. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for this time. Your blood cleanses us. Thank you for your sacrifice. We have life simply because you paid the price. You gave yourself up that I, that we, that those who may accept your sacrifice so that we may live. Thank you for not withholding yourself and doing for us what we could not accomplish on our own the means by which we can stand before God the Father. Thank, thank you for the wholeness that we have in you. Thank you for faithfully carrying out the work entrusted to you by your Father. Be with us as we dismiss to our groups tonight. May our discussions be a time of uh, welcome encouragement, of challenge, and of testimony and witness to the wonderful work and the working of your Spirit in our lives. May you be glorified in and through the lives of the men in this study. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.